Smart Alex Show podcast. Smart Alex Show, baby! What's up with it, gang? Welcome to another episode of the Smart Alex Show podcast. Appreciate you guys tuning in. It's about 11.45 on a weeknight. Out here recording on the grind, ready to bring you guys this content. Um, just got done with a little, you know, Austin FC game. Got the 3-0 dub. Went with the homies to watch, you know, got to gotta work hard, play hard, trying to, trying to enjoy life. Been some busy times, uh, working with the UT athletic department in communications and then started working with a sports marketing agency. So exciting times. Um, but nonetheless, this episode I'm bringing to you guys is a special one to me, an intriguing one to me because it's recorded with someone that I grew up playing against on the soccer field for a couple years and grew up watching throughout our, our young careers. Um, and it's just been awesome to see him go all the way to the pro level, get drafted by the MLS and play in some of the lower division teams um, at the highest level within American soccer, you know, be the captain of a division one program that is UNC, all incredibly impressive stuff. So to, to see him do that is impressive and I think whenever you're able to talk with someone that's reached the highest level of excellence within any human endeavor or field, whether it be, you know, sports or art, um, writing, running a business, etc., there's a lot of value to be gained when you speak with someone who has worked very hard to get where they are and has achieved the highest level of excellence. So if you're someone that is looking to just excel in life, or if you're a kid or a high schooler, college athlete or professional trying to get to that highest level. This is a great interview to watch in terms of Giovanni talking about what it took from a young age and the support from his family to get to the highest level within American soccer. So another thing, we're switching it up on the podcast now. Instead of me putting the outline with the timestamps for every part of the conversation, I'm just going to throw it out there for you guys. Um, I'm a big fan of the saying, you know, perfectionism is the enemy of progress. And a lot of times with perfectionism, you have small increment, incremental benefits to the things you're doing, but they cost you a lot of time, right? So for, in my example, right, I'm really busy with life right now and I wanna keep recording these episodes because I love doing it. I love conversing with people and learning about how they do what they do, uh, seeing what they're passionate about, what lights them up, right? So. Um, want to keep recording these episodes and putting them out for you guys. But the problem is if I go back and try to edit that and put the timestamps out, that takes hours, right? So I just want to pump these things out for you guys. So trying something new, no timestamps. Y'all let me know how y'all feel about that. Um, if you haven't already, drop a like, hit a subscribe. Love you guys. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, today on the podcast, we've got a soccer legend in the house. A soccer legend that I can proudly say, you know, I blocked a couple of his shots when we were little kids. So I can now say I blocked a, a professional athlete's shots. Um, but he scored plenty of bangers on me. So there's that. Got to give credit where it's due. So we played together in middle school. You know, he, he broke my team's heart. It was real competitive in the at our middle school era, you know, for the bragging rights of who was going to win those little championships. So beat us in the championship there. Went on to play at my rival high school in a sense at Jesuit high school you know 2017 2010 Texas UIL state champs he scored a lot of goals there was a beast there scored three goals against my high school team scored a hat trick if I was in goal it might have been two maybe not three but you know I, I wasn't the starter at that time at goalkeeper he played at the academy level for FC Dallas and was drafted by his hometown team so a hometown hero in a sense then now plays for Union Omaha in the USL League One. He played Division I collegiate soccer at the illustrious program that is UNC. Was a beast there. He's now getting his MBAs while recovering from ACL surgery. So this dude is just grinding on all cylinders, you know, academically, athletically. Someone that I grew up with. Had a lot of fun playing against, challenged me a lot, and who I'm honored to call a friend, Giovanni Montesioca. What's up, bro? What's up, man? I appreciate that introduction. It's crazy you saying everything that I've, you know, kind of gone through. It just, you know, kind of puts me in awe a little bit, like, wow. I, yeah, dude. I, know, I, I did a little bit there, maybe. 
Wait, what was that? No, I was just saying that, like, it kind of just reminds me of back all those times to, to get where I'm at now. And it's just, it's, it's just kind of good to hear, you know? Yeah, dude. No, it's, uh, it's crazy, bro. Like, what do you, what do you think looking back, bro? Was there any moments where like, you knew for sure you were going to be able to make it to the MLS or, or was there a lot of times where you're like, I don't, I don't know if this dream is going to pan out. Ooh, I mean, I mean, I started playing since I was four and it was kind of just, you know, been a dream of mine. My uncle, he played in the, in the MLS for sporting KC. So he was kind of my like role model and I kind of looked up to him and I went to watch a couple games when I was young. I was like, man, this is something I want to do one day. And, yeah, man, I just worked hard. You know, I had had uh, great people around me who loved the game of soccer and my family. And, yeah, they just pushed me, and I kind of just always, you know, tried really hard and, you know, and worked on my craft. And But there was definitely times where, like, man, I don't know if I can make it definitely when I went to college. Okay. So yeah. at college, that was the level where you finally kind of, like, had that challenge of, like, RK, everybody here is on this level. Like, now I really got to, you know – differentiate myself like get to that next level yeah 100 percent. look i mean like from growing up since i went to college i was always a starter you know that was always i was always kind of just used to you know that kind of role and then whenever i went to college everybody everybody was the same like everybody was the best in their team you know sure. and we all came together and so it was kind of hard because i had to re i registered in my freshman year because you know i wasn't ready to play at that level and that kind of changed my attitude and changed the things that I needed to do to, to be better and, and to be able to play at that level. So I got you, bro. that was a challenging year. Dude, so you're, you come from like a, a soccer family, bro. Like yeah. you know, a lot of families are sports families or soccer families, but, but some more than others, right? Like I have some friends, right? The Alemans, they own soccer plex in East Dallas. All the all the brothers played club, you know. One of the brothers brothers plays in Jalisco uh, for Atlas FC. So like, yeah. you know, some families live it more than others, and I right. feel like your family lives it, right? Like your uncle played at the highest level, and then like who who else in your family has has played like at the highest level or coached? Like, are you is Red your cousin? No, he's just a real good friend of mine. Okay. He actually played under my uncle, so okay. that's kind of we connected. That. No, but my grandpa coached me. He was my one of my first coaches. He started coaching me at four. So my grandpa loves soccer. This is man, my grandpa. That's all he does is watch soccer, man. You see him right now. That's all he does. So he was kind of the one that 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 took me on there. He taught me really everything that I know today. And then my my dad also coached me, and my uncle that played pro coached me. So like I was always you know coached by guys that that loved the game of soccer, and that was able to push me, and they pushed me to you sure. know to be better and yeah i mean my mom played soccer also so yeah. it's kind of like so yeah we just we soccer was a, a big big thing in my family everybody bro even even your mom that's wild um yeah, mom. yeah so you say it was like mo like i always tell people when they ask me like how i have achieved success or anything right i always give credit to like everyone that helped me get here like i'm, I'm a big believer in that quote like it takes a village to get where you are so Perfect. like you know I have an uncle who's a big mentor to me and like my dad and, and other family members and friends and previous coaches and teachers. Right. So like I always give credit where it's due. Um, and that's really dope. Cause it's like, I, I can see it within you that like you are the same, like you're very aware that like, you know, because of grandpa and uncle and dad and mom and everybody, you were able to get to where you are, bro. So that's dope. Like how, how did it feel getting drafted and knowing like your grandpa, this is what he lives and breathes. And he always found joy in watching you play. Like, how did it feel to get drafted and, and know you made them all proud? And it's crazy because um, whenever I got drafted and I wasn't even supposed to be on the draft list because I, I had I, FC Dallas already had my hunger, right? So I was surprised in the beginning to be like, I didn't know I was supposed to be on this. But the thing is, so 2018, is when I had my, one of my best years in college. And then 2019 is when I tore my ACL. Mm. So I tore my left ACL in 2019. So 20, 2020 is when COVID happened. So there was no mm. season. And then 2021 was the draft. So they they kind of based my my stock value in my 2018 year. And most teams were hesitant because, you know, I'm coming off ACL surgery. So they didn't really know what, you know, if I could bounce back, whatever. Sure. But then whenever I got the call from Rusty Dallas, oh, we dropped, you know, I got dropped in round three. Like, it just kept going. I was one of the ones at the end. The last one's like, wow. 
I didn't know what to feel, what to expect. But I'm a competitor, you know, I'm always going to be mad because I was going to be, you know, drafted, you know, in round one. But, I mean, yeah. it was a real experience, you know, you know, just be able to, you know, hear my grandpa say he's proud of me and my mom, my dad, you know, everyone around me, like, just, you know, extremely proud of you, especially bouncing back from ACL injury. 100%, bro. That's that's the competitor problem, within all of us, right? That's like the yeah. athlete within all of us. Like, it doesn't matter what level you're at. You could right. be the best of the best, but you still want more. Right. You know what I mean? But that's dope that you were able to, like, celebrate in that moment. Like, I made it. At yeah, it was a small celebration. I'll be honest. It was it was hard to take in, but, you know, I celebrated it and, and you know, was able to have a, finish my college career in a high note. So Yeah, bro. That's what's up. But what a weird time, too, because, like – um. I'm sure in 2018, you just had that badass season. You didn't think the years were going to get so crazy right after, like, no. you know, to tear your ACL and then COVID happened. All of a sudden, it's like two, two and a half years that just, like, yeah. go by, you know, and it's it's crazy, bro. Man, it was crazy when I tore my ACL. I'll uh, be honest, it was the best I felt going into the season. I was the most fittest. I never worked that hard in that summer going prior. I was really fit. I was looking really good. Yeah. Our team was looking really good. And then the day before our first game, preseason game, uh, in practice, tournament, uh, just doing a 1v1s and I faked to go right and then boom, heard a pop. Shit. So, you, so you made a move to go right? To so yeah, we were doing one move. Like, like how, how did you do it when you heard the pop? Like what happened? I just went down. I just remember, oh no, this, this is not good. This is not good, you know? I just started thinking about it because my uncle, who played professionally his first two years, he tore his ACL both mm -hmm. left and right. And my mother has to race. So it kind of runs in our family a little bit, yeah. You know, it's so funny how that works because, like, yeah. um, I tore my left ACL. I came out of the box in high school in a practice. And um, our forward, Will Gates, he's, like, fast as fuck, right? So, like, I, I sprinted out there. And, you know, like, this is the thing I hate about playing on turf as opposed to like a natural grass field is like, you know, when your cleats really dig into the turf, yeah. Yeah. Like they get stuck sometimes. So my left cleats got stuck and I yeah. just didn't decelerate it on. When I cleared the yeah. ball out of bounds, I kind of turned a little bit and then it just popped mm -hmm. and it was a loud yeah. ass pop, bro. You know how it is loud. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. And, you know, then it's six months of recovery, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing, bro. Like, I, I respect you for what, what is this? Your second time recovering from ACL? My second time, yeah. Is it uh, the same knee or different knee? No, my my good, my right knee, my strong okay. leg. Damn, but, but, respect to you because it's not easy, bro. What, what's that been like? Like, you know, recovering the the second time. It's been extremely difficult. I, I can't lie. You know, I went to a little phase after when I realized that you know I did tear it, like. You know, I was sad because, you know, I, I kind of took a big chance coming and playing again this year, you know, moving away from home, moving away from my girlfriend back in Dallas, you know, doing that, that long distance and to, to, you know, I was really starting to play well and I was starting to get my feet under and then boom, after our third game in the season. Tell me I see again, but this one's been a lot harder though. Since yeah. I did meniscus, a little bit of meniscus, so the recovery process has been a lot slower. And mentally, it's been hard for me because, you know, I'm kind of in that space if I want to continue playing or, you know, start, start you know, focusing on the future because, you know. I got you. So it's been extremely hard. I can't lie, you know. I got a little depressed maybe a little bit because, you know, I put so much into it. You know, I sacrificed a lot to be here and then for that to happen. It's kind of like the why me kind of, you know, start seeing you a lot, you know, when you kind of go into it. But, you know, after I was able to come on the other side, you know, I'm feeling a lot better now. I'm in a better space. So, so that's, that's what's up, bro. Now, my respects yeah. to you, man, because um, I know, like, depression hit me when it happened to me at the high school level, right? Like, I, I did it before playoffs, and that, that hit me hard. It was my junior year. And um, I can't imagine at the level you're at, you know what I mean? Like, all the sacrifice you've put into playing and making it to that level and you want to finish off the dream right you want to get back to mls and finish it off you know what i mean and uh when you move all the way out there it's just like i, I could imagine it's tough bro like what what do you do to kind of help your your like mental health i guess to to persevere through it like how do, how do you how did you come out on the other side yeah, I mean, I'm pr I'm pretty big on podcasts. You know, I kind of listen to a lot of you know guys like Cameron Haynes, David Goggins, you know, Jacko Willick, um, some other guys that 
you know, I like to listen to every time and time again. And I mean, I love, I enjoy working out. So that's kind of been my new hobby. That's kind of my, been my therapy place right now. And just getting it early in the morning, man, I enjoy those early workouts, you know, kind of sets the tone for the day, but I just like to stay busy and I have great people around me again, you know, they help me a ton. They're so you know, caring and kind of always there for me if I need anything. So that's been helpful too. So. Yeah, dude, I think that's a big part of it. Like your, uh, your support group. I feel yeah. like, um, Huge. for, for almost all successful people, definitely for most, it's like a big part of it. Like we had said before is like, the family, the friends, that support group, because it's real hard to like go through tough things in life alone, bro. But now nah, I respect it, and I know you'll you'll come out of it, bro. How much? Uh, how much? How many more months of recovery you think to till you're back on the field? Three months right now, so I probably got like another four months. Another four months. Maybe. More four, yeah. four months. I feel like you just got through the the thick of it, right? Like the tough, kind of the toughest part, right? Where you're co- like kind of completely immobilized at first. And yeah. then the tough part comes again in a few months when you're back yeah. on the field. Back the, the fear field. of, like, you know, re-injuring is in there, you know? Yeah. But I, I want to say, because, you know, I already went through it once. I wouldn't have – the first time, you know, when I came back, I was like, oh, you know, I was a little nervous, a little shaky. Yeah. But, you know, I, I've experienced it, so I know what it's like. You know, that's a good thing, kind of have something to go off. And I think – I mean, I just don't know if I'm going to continue playing. So that's the thing. So I got to keep mm-hmm. debating about right now. But what, yeah. what would you do if, if you stop playing, bro? Like, what would be the next move? Bro, start from the ground up somewhere, you know. That's why I'm getting my NBA degree. So maybe in a year from now, I can get a better job. But my my father owns a company, uh-huh. and he kind of needs help in that. So there's some probably I could do and go and help him out, help grow his business, and then and then see what I can do from there. But yeah, that's what's up, bro. That's what's up. I mean, with an NBA, bro, you'll be able to get your foot in the door almost anywhere. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm trying to get that's ahead. That's one of that. the best degrees out there. So, I mean, that that's that's powerful right there, bro. So that's what's yeah. up. Would you ever think about going into coaching, like at the team level, or doing training sessions or anything like that as well? Or one of thousand percent. I I mean, that's something I do now. When I was back home in the summer and stuff, I would train kids. I kind of have my own little uh, little training things that I do. Uh, I do some here as well. So I, I really enjoy doing that. I really enjoy helping kids get better. You know, I love to see them say, you know, a great session or, you know, I'm getting yeah. better. It's always good hearing those things. It's always good helping people and giving back, you know. And I, I mean, I love it. I really love coaching kids. You know, what do you coach them mostly? Is it like skills training? Like you're teaching? Yeah, I do skills training, skills, okay. fitness, speed work stuff like that yeah, like agility ladders like plow yeah. metrics all that shit yeah it just all depends on what the kid wants and needs and what the parents say oh this one my so i'm gonna work on that you know that's what's up bro i respect the grind i mean that's like whatever you do like it's great that you have that knowledge of the game of soccer because like it could always be a side hustle a side venture something to yeah. like ease your mind you know and bring in yeah. a little extra income no matter what you do so that's dope i always feel like it's like for any athlete you should always leverage what you learn on the field at either to give to someone else or like use it to su- succeed in business or in your personal life you know what i mean yeah man i really enjoy it like i don't know why you know i get a lot of thrill of helping people and see oh, yeah that. for and sure it, it's good. yeah it, i just i don't know i just really enjoy doing that and yeah it's been it's been good you know to be able to help people let them see kind of how i understand the game and just see what they can do better and you know it's for been sure. good though i've enjoyed it for sure, bro. For sure. Now I have no doubt you'll you'll do big things whichever route you decide to go, bro. Whether uh, whether playing and keeping it going, or, or you know finishing the NBA and going that route. But yeah. um, bro, I want to get I want to get more into what the journey was like for you to even get to that level, though, bro. Like, um, so what you, you you played club, right? Like you played classic league, and then you played academy, or what was it like when you were a kid? Yeah. So. So prior to joining the academy, uh, my dad was coaching a team. It was a it was a team that we had. I had just joined two years before going to academy. It was called Pumas. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like all my friends that I played for when I was four years old. They were all on the team, and my dad was a coach, so it was kind of a good experience. Me and my dad had a lot of heated battles because we're both competitive, and <laughs> it was overall good. It was overall good. Yeah, yeah it's crazy <laughs> when you're around me and my dad. We're we're ultra competitive. For sure. It's so funny. Some people don't like being around us sometimes because, you know, it's just, it's just how we are. But I feel good. that 100 percent, bro. I feel yeah, like me and my dad are the same way. Me and my dad are the same way. My dad is like, I've learned to, I don't know, 
tame it a little bit, but my dad is very direct with it. So he like kind of almost offends people sometimes with the competitiveness, uh-huh. but that's, that's the way it is, bro. That's the way it is. It's a beautiful thing between father and son, you know? Yeah. So I was, I did that classic league and it was a great experience. My dad helped me uh, tremendously in improving my, my game. And then, uh, it was a state cup game and, and Luchi Gonzalez had came in, you know, Luchi man, he coached FC Dallas and now he's with the national team. Mm-hmm. Anyways, he came to see me play in one game, the state cup final. I did really well. We were playing against uh, FC Dallas classic team and I did really well that game. And mm-hmm. after that, he was like, Hey, yeah, um, I want your son to come join us. But the only thing is my mother, she didn't want me to leave Jesuit at the time. Cause I was at Jesuit. So it was a big debate on my, my, my dad's like, no, he needs to go. And I was like, I want him at Jesuit. So it was a big decision to make. And they kind of left it to me to make that decision because they didn't want, you know, later on saying, oh, you know, like me pointing the finger type of thing. So it was my decision. And then day I chose to go to FC Dallas. 100%. Bro, here, hold on. Let me me, uh, interrupt real quick. Like, so for the people that don't know, how would you describe what academy is? Because like a lot of people that are listening that maybe want to get to that level or or from out of Texas, right? They might not know like that you know, what academy is and that you can't play high school ball anymore when you join yeah. academy. So, like, what? how would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, you kind of started off, yeah, like, like when you join an academy team, you're just with them and you can't play, you can't do any other activities, you know, other sports there in the high school that you're in. Um, in academy, typically, you know, most of them are MLS affiliation, some are not. Everything's changed now since I left it. You know, there's different leagues now. Yeah, it's so complicated. There's so many things now. But yeah, it was just kind of like a like a higher level, you know, of uh, of you know playing regular classic league, and mm. it was you know they bring in all the best talent from all over you know all over the U.S. We had guys on my team from everywhere, so yeah. so it was just a way to help develop you. So if you do get signed to a first team or you do get picked by a top college, you know, you're kind of more prepared than. And most of the kids 100 percent. It's, it's pretty interesting how like american sports leagues work right like you know you see all around the world like for you know for example in europe right you have fc barcelona real madrid and they have these you know academies from little kids age all the way up and they pull players from these academies right like messi from argentina went to play for the barcelona academy as a kid and worked his way up very quickly to the highest level right and you see that like in mls You've got Houston Dynamo, right, or Houston Dash on the women's side, and you've got FC Dallas. And from the bottom level, they got these academy players, the best players, like, you know, like yourself, that they work up through the system. Um, So I guess if I could, like, you know, explain it to people, it's like think of recreational soccer, right, where it's like kind of just for fun, whatever, you know, the coach may or may not know, usually doesn't know much about soccer. And then you've got Premier League, which is like the lowest level of select slash club soccer. And then you've got Classic League. Yeah. And then you've got Academy and now you've got, well, I guess, yeah, like you said, you know, Academy is so different. Now you got ECNL, so, so it's very now, weird, yeah. but basically so, you got that and then the pro level. Right. Right. So, so basically Academy, all it was is trying to prepare the best talent for the next level to see who they can bring up. So it, and it's like that all over the world. They're trying to, sure. bring, you know, for sure. Versus like in, you know, football, it's you've got, you know, peewee football and then you, yeah. you, know, you play at the high school level and play at the college level and get drafted. Yeah. Um, or the same thing for basketball, right? You got AAU and then you play high school, you're ranked, you play college, you're ranked, you go to the NBA. Um, but, bro, so when you played in that state cup final, were you playing for your dad's team? Uh, were you playing for my dad's team. Yeah, y'all, y'all were y'all were badass then to be in the state cup final you know yeah, y'all, yeah. y'all were an independent club or this was like a larger yeah. club that y'all's family ran no, it was just an independent club okay. just an independent that's club, yeah. that's pretty rare like it's pretty rare for an, indep- an independent club you know to compete at d1 yeah. classic and go all the way to the state cup final it's pretty yeah. dope yeah it was cool so yeah that's did, where uh, I did seen. ivan bersiaga play on that team as well he did and then i think he left midway but yeah he might so he's actually my cousin, Ivan is my cousin. Okay, that's who I got it confused yeah. with. I was like, I know there's someone that played at Dunn or St. Mary Carmel. Yeah, Dunn, Dunn, okay, Dunn, so yeah. Ivan. Yeah, that's what I was like. This is, y'all are like a legit family, you know, family of soccer all the way. So you, uh, what, like, um, what went into your decision, like, of, like, leaving a college preparatory high school, not only yeah. one of the best academic high schools in the state of Texas, but 
one of the best athletic high schools in the state of Texas. Like when yeah. I was in high school, Jesuit won the baseball state championship, multiple D1 athletes on the baseball team, the, you know, soccer state championship, multiple yeah. D1, D2, D3 athletes on that team, right? So like what, what went into your decision-making there? Was it like, I know I'm going to go pro, I'm going to have a good chance once I go to play academy and I'm not going to yeah. have that chance over here? What was it? Man, yeah, I think that was a big thing, you know. Um, not only did going to FC Dallas provide, you know, the next level and professionally, but also would have provided me better D1 offers. Because at the time, they were getting a lot of, uh, like the big D1 schools were getting players from the academy. That was kind of like a big thing at that time. Or it still is where they, you know, the best talent are considered are the ones that play in the academy. So I think that was another decision that factored, you know, me going into me going to FC Dallas. But even at Jesuit, not only did I play soccer, I did cross country as well at Jesuit. And that's something that I really enjoyed because I was, I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, middle school, I actually won the district seventh and eighth grade year. And then you know, I was kind of like a, like a pretty good runner, I would say, yeah. especially going against all the other Catholic schools. Ah, and sure. this Mexican oh, wow. kid uh, running cross country, you're like, who is this, you know? You know, yeah. cross country, no, it's mostly, mostly now. Obviously, in our, in our Catholic school system, it was mostly white. You know, very the, sure. you know, the Mexicans. We had the little lower. You know, not the best. Yeah. You know, type of environment for middle schools, but you know, I was able to compete with those guys and you know, show that you know, this is something ah, that we for can sure. Love. That's funny, yeah. bro. The, the only Mexican out there in the top of the rankings for cross country. Yeah, that's yeah. why, like, like I'll say it in the intro, it was so uh, competitive because, like, within that little league, you know, it was like just the Mexican schools competing to see yeah. who would win and have bragging rights. But uh, how, how important was your endurance to, like, how your, your style of playing on the soccer field? Like, you think your ability to, you know, keep pace and have that speed and that, you know, just agility and endurance that helped you in cross country. You think that was real important to your style of playing on the soccer field? Oh, man, immensely. Because so the reason I was so doing well in Pumas, because, you know, I was still a judge. So I was running cross country and I was so fit, man. I was really in really good shape. Uh -huh. But the thing is, I didn't like cross country at the time. Now I look back, I was like, man, I really, you know, I do like it now that I look back. But when I was there, my parents, and they had to force me to go and do cross country because I was like, mm -hmm. like it's gonna be better for you, gonna be more fitter than everybody else. I was like, why well, I had to do this? Nobody else is doing it, you know, kind of complaining like that. But yeah. even though when I went to training, I always gave it my best. That's just who I am, you know. Always, every time I do something, you know, I kind of had to, you know, I'm a competitor. Once I get in the environment, let's go. It's time to go, you know, type of thing. But yeah, man, it helped me a ton. I think that's what kind of helped prepare me in that time, you know, running that much. You know, I was running, logging in a lot of miles. There's, you know, sometimes when I went from a cross country mat, like uh, on the Saturday and then go play a game right after. So that was yeah, something bro. I'm grateful for my parents, man. They pushed me in that. And they always tell me, you say, you see how important that was? And it was, it was extremely important. Hell yeah, bro. Yeah. So wh where did you go to high school? Like after you left Jesuit? And you oh, so uh, I went to a high school in Frisco called Lone Star. Okay. So I went there. And um, they actually allowed us to train in the morning. So we trained at like 8 a.m. And then we would go to class and, at 10.30. Oh, shit. And it went from 10.30 to 4. What kind of school was it? Is it like a public school? In yeah, it was a public school. It was okay. a public school. And okay. that was another big thing, going to a public from private. Because I've gone to private my whole life, yeah. you know, and transitioning to a public school was a little different, for sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So is that school known for doing that? Like they'll let you train doing your other sports related things in the morning and then you can go to class yeah, afterward? Yeah, FC Dallas and them had a little deal or a little partnership. Got you. So it was like all the academy players would uh, would go to that school or what? Correct, yeah. Oh, shit. Even people driving in from all over the Metroplex? All over the Metroplex. Yeah. You know, we, we had to commute. Like I commuted from Addison to Frisco my other teammates that I, that went to college with me also they from oak cliff all the way to frisco every day yeah it's a fucking so, drive yeah. so man everybody put in a shit to <laughs> that's a different world bro from the cliff to to frisco, yeah, to the frisco bro. Big yeah. <laughs> that's crazy yeah. nah that's what's up bro so 
Talk to me about your, your UNC days, bro. What was that like playing at one of the biggest college brands, not only in America, but in the world? You know, that's where Michael Jordan played hoops at. You know, like they're notorious for being one of the best soccer programs for women or men's always, right? Like what, what was it like playing at UNC, bro, going over there to North Carolina? Man, it's crazy. Like when I went on my first visit and it was snowing that day when I went, my very first unofficial visit was my junior year. I went, it was snowing. So I really didn't get how really nice it looked, but I still fell in love with the school. Um, the guys that hosted me, they're still my friends today. It's crazy, but we're still good friends. And yeah, they were kind of the ones that kind of like got me into like, yeah, I know it's good. I could come here. And I love the colors of UNC, that Carolina blue, man. It's just when you wear it and you just seeing it, it just hit different. And it was a big, you know, having to, you know, I've always lived in Dallas, you know, I never went in and then having to go to another state you know, make new friends and, you know, go into a different, you know, completely different environment that you're not used to. My fr- my freshman year was definitely difficult for me. Mm-hmm. Not only because I wasn't playing, but just being away from home, you know, I got a little homesick, you know, it was kind of hard. But I think, th- I think that freshman year was the most pivotal time in my life because it taught me so much things about myself. And um, we ended up making the final four that year and we lost in the semifinals. And it's like, man, you know, it, it kind of got me excited for the following year. But it's funny because my coach, you know, he's my, he's kind of my close friend now. We got really close. At the end of that year, you know, I talked to him, like, hey, so, you know, if I, you know, I come back, you know, like, what do you think about me coming for next year? Because, you know, we did spring ball. He's like, you know, I don't think, I don't think you're going to be playing that much again the following year. I said, okay. And I kind of got motivated by that. So in the, in the summer, I worked hard, worked hard. Sophomore year, I surprised him on the first day. And, you know, I kind of started getting beginning playing more. And again, we made it to another final four that year. So we made it back to back final four, lost in the same final again. Fuck, dude. What did what did you do in the off season that that improved your game so much and, and allowed you to get okay, my grandpa, man? Uh-huh. He put me he put me through some some good stuff. He kind of has like an old mindset when it comes to training. And he just we just went after it, man. We went after it. Is it really- like y'all looked at things about your game and about the playing style at UNC right. and your grandpa was like, this is what you need to adjust about your game and you practice? Kinda, yeah, that's kind of when I went and had that talk with my coach, kind of telling me the things I needed to work on, mm. get a little stronger, get, you know, get in better condition, you know, type of thing. And then, but that summer, you know, I trained hard, but it wasn't until my junior year going in. It's when I, it just went another level of our training. Because okay. um, so on, typically in the summers they they tell us to play for a, a summer league team to stay fit throughout the year, and I played with a club called Dente Diablos, and that was a good experience. It was a really good experience. And then yeah, after that finished, me and my grandpa got out there a month before I had to report back there at Keys Park, man, training, going after, you know, going to little sand pit, doing all these different type of things you know to prepare yeah. me it was an everyday thing but we got after him man and I came in that you know that following my third year the fittest I was the fittest guy on the team we did the beep test normally I don't know you probably done a beep test before maybe possibly no I actually haven't bro I actually haven't walk me through it. what's it like so a beep test basically it's just test your fitness endurance so every time you'll come in in the beginning the captain, like, okay, we're going to do a beat test before we meet with the coaches to see where everybody's at because the coaches want to see it too. But there's a lot of NCAA rules that you have uh-huh. to avoid. So the beat test, it's it's a cone. You, you have a cone and then 22 yards or 20 meters, 20 meters is another cone. And you hear a beep, a beep, uh-huh. and then you have to get to the other cone, beep. And then it'll beep again. So it gets three beeps. You have to make it back on the third. So it's beep. like side to side cones. Is what you're it's saying. Just, yeah, four, yeah, forward and you had to turn, run back. So okay. you run through, run through. It's kind of like a shuttle. Kind okay, of. I got you. And you just keep going. And the uh, the levels get, whenever you get to a new level, it gets faster, the beep. So it'll be mm-hmm. beep, beep, beep. And you have to get there. You have to make it. So that was kind of our beep test, typically what we did. Okay. Yeah, I came in and I killed it that year. I won it. Damn. So what is that test like? Like your your agility and speed in a sense, along with your endurance, because you're like moving quickly to that beep. Yeah, you have to get to that cone and then back. 
Okay. But it's the 20 meters, and you just keep on yeah. continuing if it continues. Yeah. So, because typically in soccer, it's a lot of cutting. Exactly. The, the most you probably run 20 yards, depending on what position you play. Exactly. But that was kind of like a good indicator to see what your fitness level was at. Yeah. No, that makes sense because, like, yeah. soccer, it's not only, you know, long distance endurance in terms of, like, you're running a lot of miles during the game, depending on what position you are, but also those short bursts. Like yeah. someone plays you a through ball up top and yeah. you're fucking, you know, sprinting towards the ball or you're, you know, you know, you're cutting inside or whatever the case may be. And then plus like physiologically, right? Like lactic acid starts to build in your muscles when, you know, you're taking that moment of rest and then boom, you sprint and your muscles are, I forget what it's called. I think it's like um, oxidative stress. I might be butchering it, but it's basically like where your muscles are operating with no oxygen. You just on a quick burst, you didn't even breathe in or out. They're just going and then you catch your breath again and do it again. So it, it is a test to like really see how yeah. in shape you are. It's on a lot of levels. So it, it is yeah. a, like a pretty brutal test. Yeah. And, and, and if anybody watching this, I would like to see what the fitness level, you just got to go on YouTube and it's called the intermediate yo-yo test. And you just do that intermediate yo-yo test. So you want to see where your fitness is at. I, I was a good indicator. We get it around level 18.5 and up. That, that means you, you had a really good spot. That was typically our indicator, you know, okay. for, for guys. So you were in the best shape of your life that year, huh? That's 2018. Like, yep, 2018. Have, that's what's up, bro. That, that's that mad respect to you there because I feel like there's things that differentiate athletes. Like some athletes are born with God-given athleticism in terms of size and speed. And some guys are, you know, very smart, have incredible touch, reflex, whatever, right? And they, they play the game very tactically. But, like, I feel like you can tell the difference between different breeds of athletes in terms of right. how they return from the offseason. Oh, like, one time, that was a big indicator. The guys who can control their level of effort and, like, think strategically, like, what do I need to improve on this offseason that I could do that, that I didn't do my best last year to improve on this year to take my game to the next level? mentally physically etc so i feel like the dogs are the dogs the beasts the players that i'm the most fan of are the players that come back in the in the next season after a good off season and improve drastically i feel like that's like that mamba mentality that kobe right. mentality that a lot of players don't have that are complacent or that like just so you know or take their god-given ability for granted and don't put in the work right. so yeah. respect to you there that was something that I always try to do like at the high school level, you know, and, and honestly, when I think back to like the high school level, right. Like I always went to win a state championship at BL. Right. I kind of have no regrets because I know I went as hard as I possibly could, but then I do think back to some things I maybe could have done strategically to get better in the off season. For example, for me, I was very good on the ground, very good reflexively. Um, like, I think honestly, two things I didn't work on that I should have. And, and one of my off seasons was like um, my distribution with my, oh, feet. Yeah. like right. I was great. I was great distributing in the air, you know, right. throws, volleys, you know, different types of punts, but in terms of putting it on the ground and being able to cut through the yeah. wind and playing the ball out from the back very quickly, or like get going out for balls in the air. I think like those are, that, that's when I think back and I'm like, okay, you have to think very strategically for, how you work hard in the off season. Like you don't just work hard, but like you work hard on certain things that, you know, make your game more optimized, more efficient, but uh, not nah, respect to yeah. you there, bro. So, so back to back final four losses, bro. What the, who did y'all lose to? Our first year, uh, we lost to Stanford and PKs. We went all the way to the 15 PK taker. Both. Damn. 15. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough way to lose. I'll tell you. Holy shit, I went through the whole starting 11 and then some. Yeah, bro, <laughs> insane. What? It was crazy. It was crazy. I've never even heard of a, a game go, going that deep in PK. We're playing in Houston, Houston Dynamo Stadium. Really? 15 PKs. It was tied 0 0 the whole game. So the goalkeepers had even taken a PK at this point. Correct. What was that like for the goalkeepers taking the PKs? Like, did they both make it on each other or what? I think so, bro. I don't remember, but <laughs> I didn't remember going that long, like freaking nervous and, you know, getting goosebumps and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then the, the second year we lost to Indiana 1-0, but I think, you know, I think we still played better ball that game against them. Yeah. And then 2018, the year that I did really well, we only had lost like two games or three games a whole year. 
um, for some reason, we had a curse. For some reason, in the ACC tournament, we always lost. So we would always get a bye, and we'll lose that, that next game. For some reason, we had a curse for like eight years, eight, uh-huh. nine years. And we were able to break it that 2018. We made it to the ACC championship final, and we lost 1-0 to Louisville. Oh, that, that one hurt for sure. Um, and then we ended up losing. We got to buy in the NCAA tournament because we were ranked so high. And then we lose to JMU 2-1. Uh, and again, what, they, they know, what were they we, ranked in the bracket? They probably weren't ranked that high because they had to play a game before. Yeah. yeah we're, we're supposed to win that game. And, you know, stat and all that wise. And we end up losing. Something about the bye week. You think something about it like kind yeah, of sucks that, you out or gets you out of shape? I don't know. I don't know what happened to us. And we literally went down 1 0 that year and, and I, I tied the game. And then we literally could have gone up 2 1 and we missed. And then they end up scoring in the second half, like late. And then we just we just end up losing that game. And then our and then the 2019 year, that's when I had torn my ACL and we didn't even make the tournament that year. So it was our worst year. So worst year for you personally? For, for, worst year for, the team. Oh, for, for UNC, yeah. Worst, yeah. yeah. Not making the tournament. You know, that's not right. our standard. Yeah, that's what very rare do. for y'all's program. Yeah. And then, Man. so, you know, obviously I missed that year. And then, the, you know, and then it was my time because I was a senior. It was my time to be, mm-hmm. normally the seniors, the captains of the team. And, and I was able to take that role my senior year. Okay. And then we ended up making it a Final Four. But losing again, one zero. Shit, bro. So final four three times, huh? Times, yeah. My Very last year made it. Damn. Lost to Marshall, and they only had one shot that game. One us. we had nine. Was it like a breakaway or what happened? It was just a little fluky mistake. Or the guy was just wide open in the back, and he just tapped it in. But but that game I could have tied it. Also, I hit the freaking post. It's, I still think about it today. It's like those moments. You know, it's crazy. I remember every goal I scored. And every shot I could have made too. It's crazy. It's a weird thing that I that I have. I can tell you how I played this ball and everything that went through it. It's crazy. I kind of have that, you know, kind of. What happened? What, what was the play like? Um, I think one of my teammates he had dribbled down the middle. And he was trying to take the guy, but deflected the the defender deflected it, and it came right into me, and I was inside the box, and I hit it, and it hit the post. And I had another chance too. And I, I whiffed it and I missed the ball inside the box. And it was I had a really good game that, that game too. I was playing really good. And yeah, I don't know. I still think about that. Yeah, dude. Sometimes weird shit happens, bro. The ball literally doesn't bounce your direction, bro. It's crazy. It was awful. It was awful. Crazy, crazy but, shit. I, mean, it was, bro. I learned a lot of being a leader too, you know. For sure. And, you know, us coming back from that tough year and then us having to go through COVID and then, you know, come back and able to to compete like we did and make it that far. It was it was a great experience overall. No doubt. So you still got to end your senior year on a on a high note. Yeah. So sure. so what happens from there, bro? Like like how long after that were you drafted? No, I was drafted before that season. Okay. Last year. So, so you drafted before you already knew you were gonna correct. come over to S C D before. So in January the in twenty twenty one is when the draft happened um i could have decided to go with that style at the time do a joint preseason or stay you know and play the the, the spring ball because we, we didn't have a season 2020 when we normally do yeah. from august to yeah. november makes sense so they pushed it to the following spring so i decided to stay i decided to stay play spring ball did that and then i joined fc dallas like six games in already Two weeks, you know, I didn't feel like I really got a good shot because, you know, they already had mm-hmm. signed all their forwards and all that. So it was kind of like, you know, it was a difficult for them to sign me, which I get, understand. Mm-hmm. Kind of thinking back, you know, you know, I enjoyed my experience. Well, maybe go join them in preseason because that's where they can see you the best. Mm-hmm. But I was also coming off my ACL and I wanted to get some games in. So it was, it was a lot of factors that decided for me to play. For sure, for sure. For sure. So you think like maybe – not being there earlier affected it a little bit? Maybe a little bit because then that's when they end up sending guys. Yeah. But also maybe I could have done a little better too. You know, I'm not just going to point the figure. Yeah, for sure. So, so, but yeah, that's kind of happened. And I could either play with North Texas, which is their second team, but I decided to go and that's when I joined Loudon. 
Gotcha. Oh, so how does it how does it work when you're drafted, bro? Like, you know, I'm not too familiar with yeah. the MLS like draft process, right? Like, obviously, the like, NFL you see it on TV, NBA you see it on TV. Like, what's the NFL draft? I'm sorry, the MLS draft process like? So typically, if you're sat, if you're drafting the first 10, 10 picks, you yeah. pr- you you know you definitely get a a sign like you like you sign before even having to go. Mm-hmm. And most of the chances, they're all tryouts, you know. It's a trial, basically. Like, they draft you, but you're still – it's a trial. You don't get signed automatically. Gotcha. So, you still have to go prove that you can play at that level. Gotcha. So, that's what it's kind of like. So, you don't you, – just because you drafted doesn't mean they signed you, right? Gotcha. It's really different, like, basketball, football, you know. Sure. The first round, you definitely get signed. Sometimes the second round, they get signed. But yeah. it's normally the first 10 that get a contract. Okay, so, so the top 10 picks get a contract and everyone else also is essentially a, essentially a tryout. Correct. And there you got to earn your pick. Um, how, how many players are selected in the MLS draft? Maybe 90. 90? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Or maybe 60, I don't know, 60 to 80 or not. Somewhere, somewhere between 60 and Somewhere 90. in there. Okay, I, I get what you're saying. Mm-hmm. That's so wild, bro, because it's kind of deceiving. Like, you kind of look at the draft board and you think, like, oh, shit, you know, like, these guys all, you know, they're in. You know, they got drafted. You know what I mean? But that's uh, that's interesting. Does everyone mostly get pulled from uh, from the United States, like, NCAA system, college system, or are there a lot of international players getting drafted as well? Or how, how does MLS even do all that? No, well, it's typically the college – every player that is in the college team. Okay. And then in the international level, they just, they just sign you, right? They just bring you over. Oh like yeah. If you're, example, not, if you're okay. playing in the EPL and you want to come over to oh, play yeah. MLS. Yeah. That's, that's different. That, that had nothing to do with the job. That just, yeah. when you guys are deep, deep. Yeah. It's so interesting, bro. In the world of soccer, right? Like how they have tried to make MLS more Americanized with like the draft. Yeah. And right. The playoffs and the, you know, playing division one NCAA um versus in the rest of the world it's just a totally different thing different. there's no playoffs you know there's cups there's a champions league there's a yeah. Europe cup but there's no you know you just win the championship based off your right. regular season you know points how well you did in the regular season in the yeah. table which i i am of the opinion this is very unpopular but it's like i think that's a better judge of who the best team was that year because mm-hmm. it's the whole fucking season yeah, it's the whole you know, season it's the whole season who performed the best and I think it's like very American, like it's a very American idea that like the American dream, you can go from an underdog to winning it all. You can be the yeah. last fucking seed, but in the playoffs, you went off and you yeah. won it. You overcame a lot. It's like the idea of the American dream versus Europe is a little different, but it's interesting how like, I don't know, like, I don't know. What do you think MLS should do, bro? Should they just pick a style of working, like be more European or be more like America? Or you think this way they're doing it in the middle kind of works for them? Yeah, to be honest, I really don't think it's going to change. I think it's going to yeah. stay the way it is. But, yeah, yeah I mean, like you said, like, you know, you could finish last in the one through six and make playoffs, and you could end up being that last to make it, right? Yeah. That's what in Europe, the eighth person is considered, like, one of the worst teams, technically, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of like, obviously, I understand kind of, you know, like you said, it's Americanized. And, you know, it, it does bring a little joy when you have playoffs and stuff and see, you know. Yeah who can win it you know that is kind of fun but no i definitely agree with the european style i like who's better through the whole season who was able to to, to win the most you know have the less losses it's just it's the way i think it's supposed to be because yeah. i think that's how you really judge if a team is good no nah, for sure it is entertaining though it's it fucking is, entertaining, I'm gonna say, it's entertaining it's seeing playoffs it's always fun it's always yeah. seeing those games and knowing that you know no matter where you start you know sure. you can still end up on top I think it makes it very inspiring. And it's like, there's so many things that are interesting too, bro. Like in Europe, the big dogs can spend the most in the United yeah. States. They can't, they're salary caps, you know, like yeah. even though the Cowboys are worth a lot more than the Cleveland Browns, they both got that same salary cap. We can't spend more versus, you know, in La Liga, yeah. Barcelona's always going to outspend, you know, a lot of these other small teams, but they still compete. They still find a way, which is crazy, but Bro, so like, so you um, after FCD, what what was the journey like from there, bro? Like, how did how did you kind of take the the like decision, and what did you do from there? Bro, it was a quick decision. My agent was like, hey, like you know, 
you have opportunity in Loudon, DC United likes you, they like you. They possibly would have picked you in a draft, but knowing that you're going to be with, you know, FC Dallas. So went over there at Loudon. It was a, uh, it was a very interesting experience at, for sure. Um, when I got there, I did play right away. So, you know, I was able to get games to the pro level pretty quickly mm. after I signed with them. But just the whole living environment and everything, it was kind of when you go and like, wow, you know, the college setup that you had was really good nice uh -huh. compared to when you come to these lower level teams yeah. that don't have, you know, you know, necessary funding as, you know, it's always the same. Like you just said, Barcelona, they probably had the best facilities compared to, you know, the bottom. That's how it kind of was without him because it was the lowest budget team in the USL championship. So kind of how we lived and what they gave us to eat was, you know, was interesting. You had kind of had to maneuver and and things like that. But overall, you know, I, I enjoyed the team. It was a good group of guys. Um, so so necessary when you play for a, a team that's affiliated with an MLS club, they would typically drop down the guys that don't play with the first team into the team that you're in, the second team. So so it was definitely a lot of that. So like they would automatically get the start over you because you know DC United was like, hey, like we need this guy to get minutes. So he can come back with us. So they'll come, start them. And that was kind of like the tricky thing about it too. Like you didn't know like when they're gonna bring him down, you're like, oh, I'm not gonna start. That guy's gonna start because you know he signed with DC United. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of frustrating for sure. But overall, the it was a really good level. That's dope, bro. So like I'm curious more as to what it was like. Like, you know, like you played at UNC and you know, really nice. You know the the Carolina blue, and I'm sure it was nice living on campus and stuff. Like, what well, what? Can you tell me more about like when you're at Loudon? Like, what what is it like to play at a at a lower division, you know, pro team like under DC United? You know, what is it like at that level? I know you mentioned a little bit of it, but let me see how can I put it. And I don't and I don't bash anything about it because overall, sure. I mean, like the the living we lived, it was at it was like at a hotel, it was like a convention yeah. hotel. We lived there. And then our commute wasn't that far to yeah. where our field was called Segra. It was a turf. So we, we trained there. We trained where we played at our games. Typically, that's not yeah. what we normally do. But mm -hmm. that's what we did. Um, and then DC United, they this year is crazy because they just moved their, their practice facility right next to ours. So mm -hmm. you can have that you know, ability to watch training sessions. But it wasn't like that when I was there last year. Um, what else can I say? Yeah, I mean, bro, we only won three games last year when I was there, and that was a very tough one, losing a lot of games. You know, you're not used to that kind of – because, you know, you're having to compete, you know. Typically, our, our squad was very young because they brought up academy guys, played with us, and they brought down guys. So it was a lot of – it was very inconsistent lineups, and it was everything. You know, you had to kind of go yeah. through that. Through that. and But, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot, though, for sure. Mm -hmm being there i'll tell you that the show like just just a lot for life or like yeah for life and understanding the system how the system works yeah. in soccer is it can be very political for sure for sure bro yeah. i was actually gonna ask yeah. you about that that's something yeah. i wanted to talk about like beforehand yeah. like you know i've known a lot of soccer players over the years some that were beasts when they were young and fizzled out you know when they were older in high school or college um but, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of guys say different things, right? Some guys make up bullshit, right? Like they weren't working hard enough or they just weren't good enough and they'll blame it on, oh, my coach was a dick or my coach was racist right, right. or my teammate do, yeah. or this one guy, this one, you know, like say if they're a goalkeeper, right, a, a position that's limited, you know, like either you're splitting time with another guy or you're the starter and you basically right. play all the minutes, right? Like they'd be like, oh, well, I, there was just this one guy that was a fucking beast and I just couldn't get past him. Right? That happens sometimes, right? Like the, those yeah. excuses are actually real sometimes, but a lot of times it's dudes trying to protect their own ego, right? Like, but I, yeah. basically what I'm trying to say is that I've, I've talked with a lot of guys within soccer and for me playing soccer, you kind of see how the politics work sometimes when it comes to money or when it comes to, you know, knowing people knowing coaches knowing recruiters right like what what is it like in the political side of sports like what do you think of like you know all of that navigating all that i mean i really don't experience that you know at this kind of lower level league you yeah. know especially that's affiliation is very political because okay 
you know, technically at times she can be better than some of the most of the players and you still don't get that chance. Mm-hmm. And I mean, a lot of players can tell you this, you know, the having a coach that believes in you is huge because, mm-hmm. you know, and if they don't, it's kind of hard for you to get in. Even though, look, I'm telling you, there's a lot of times where I've seen the best player on the bench. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. And it happens. You know, we all experience it. When the, the better player is sometimes on the bench and the coach just plays guys that they feel that's good for them and what they like, you know, th- that kind of happens a lot. That's why I can, not political, listen, but there's favoritism. For sure. You know, when it comes to the players that coaches, certain coaches like. And, mm-hmm. you know, I can tell you people here that ex- that experience it or anywhere anyway. everybody else can experience you know for sure and kind of, you know that's that's a big thing that i learned too that sure. you know that type of you know stance on it and just a lot of guys see it we see you know yeah. i've experienced it so that can be a big thing on not for sure know, bro. Great career and, and having a career that you know that just you know you just yeah can't so it's different. I, feel like, I feel like it's part of anything in life, right? Like it, yeah. it, it can get political and you just kind of got to keep controlling what you can control and keep working hard. And it's just like, it's just a part of life. Anything can get yeah. political. The, yeah. You know, ever since we were little kids, you know, a yeah. little class favorite and, you know, whatever. Right. And then when you get older in the workplace, you know, or just it, it can be fucking anything, right? Anything can get political and it's like, one of my mentors told me just like control what you can control at the end of the day it's really just how hard you work and how much work you put in and your mentality your perspective on you know what's going on um you know anything else is extra like any recognition from outside people is extra any recognition from others is extra but if you know you put in the work then at least you have that so yeah, dude, what, uh, so now you're at Union Omaha, bro, like, like, uh, what, what's that been like as kind of this, this newest part of the journey within soccer, and now, like, before you hit this crossroads of, like, you know, wanting to play or keep playing or move on? Hey, I kind of want to touch on something that's funny when you, yeah. when you talk about, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Go I ahead. listened to that, uh, Tim Grover, he said, you know, winning has, has no loyalty to you. Yeah. Fuck yeah. And it's very true, you know. Sometimes the guy that's in front of you doesn't work as hard as you. They don't put in the time, but they still get the opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, how can you navigate that? That's something that I learned a lot. Sometimes you can be the hardest worker and still not be rewarded. Can you keep going after that? Do you have sustained and, you know, winning endurance? Do you have, you know, can you sustain yeah. that? No matter what comes at you, right? That's something that I learned a lot, you know. You know, you can be doing good for a while, but can you sustain it? For sure. Staying that hunger, that's the most important. Can you stay hungry no matter if you even work harder than that person or they get it or you don't get that job, you know? How can you how can you keep pushing past that, right? Because a lot of times I see most people or most teammates that I've, I've gone with, they'll be like, oh, I work hard, you know, I'm better than him. They can, you know, point the blame, right? For sure. And that's something that I have to learn too because I experienced like, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. But are you really, you know, yeah. You know, are you are you hungry enough to when practice is over? You know, can you keep working no matter who's looking at you, who's saying, "Oh, you know, giving you a good job." You know, you're doing a great right. job. You just gotta work no matter. It's just a constant improvement, improvement, improvement. You know what I mean? And that's you know, listen to that Tim Grover podcast. Why Ed Milet? That one was that one was huge. Oh yeah, Ed Milet is a beast. I listened to one with him and um, I forget his name. His name might be Eric Wilson. He's um, I think I might have heard him. He's like the African American, the, the black dude who teaches. Uh, I don't know if it's some kind of mixed martial art, but it's uh, oh. maybe like Muay Thai or karate or something. But he teaches boys about like emotional intelligence. And right, like, right, 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 right. Uh, I, I listened to that one. That one really is good, man. Oh, really that was fucking awesome, good. Man. I think all, all men should that was awesome. It because it's like, it's how to be a strong man, but not to be like a insecure traumatized man that like uses weird coping mechanisms and this yeah. stupid shit dude yeah no you listen to a lot of the same guys i listen to we, we listen to a lot of the same people bro like uh and no wonder you you love running like david goggins yeah, some of the other guys you mentioned uh those are like you know the goats of fucking podcasting and the goats of motivation and being active and physical right like jocko willink i love him he's fucking awesome um yeah, Jocko, I love David it. Goggins' book. Have you read it? Can't hurt me. 
uh, I, I did the audio books and I was yeah, yeah. I'm fucking capping. Let me, let me, let me correct myself. I didn't read that shit. I fuck, I listened to the audio book. Cause he reads it. Yeah. He, he, he reads at the end of the chapters. When I first yeah. started, man, why is this other guy talking? I wanted to hear David Goggins, but, but it's cool. The, the, like the Q and a at the end, you know, like, right, right. I did enjoy that. That was badass. No, he's a, he's a beast, bro. Like taking souls. I feel like that's yeah. that part that last push in your game or your workout or your run that like where you take, you're taking souls. And I feel like that gives you the confidence to go forward in life. Like I use what he talks about in that book, the mental cookie jar a lot. Like, Oh yeah. You got to grab people, from that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you gotta grab from that, man. no, for, for people who don't know the mental cookie jar is essentially this, like think of the moments in your life where you've overcome something difficult, where you've succeeded, yeah where you've overcome the odds, where you've done well and keep those moments in your head for when, you know, that you're going through a difficult time or you think you can't accomplish something or someone told you you can't think of those moments in your life where you finished the race, won the game, won that achievement, passed that class or whatever you did that like was good. Think back to it and use that as motivation to get your next one. Whenever you feel like you just lost and shit sucks. Oh, you know what? I did make it to the MLS. I did get drafted. I did score that fucking goal when I was playing for UNC or me, right? Like I did get to UT. I did graduate. I, I did save that shot. You know, whatever it is, like just stuff to keep you in check and say like, you know what? I'm getting down on myself right now. I'm getting all depressed. I'm beating myself up. But you know what? I have done badass shit. I'm a bad motherfucker still, you know, and I could do it again. Um, and that's basically what the mental cookie jar is. But yeah, dude, um, no, those guys are badass. Those guys yeah. you listen to. Yeah, badass. I know when they say, you know, motivation is crap. Being inspired is crap because what are the days you're not motivated? What are the days you're not inspired to? The thing you need to have is discipline. That's always tell everybody. If you're disciplined, man, you have a great life because no matter what comes at you, that's why, I, you know, I'm starting to grow more and being more disciplined and you know, making keep it. I think it's important that you keep the promises you make to yourself because that gives you confidence. Yeah, bro. Nah, like uh, we could go all day on this. Yeah, shit. we go all day. Like uh, 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 Jordan Peterson stuff, says, like don't you should you shouldn't fucking you should keep your promises to yourself. Yeah. And you shouldn't lie because like the moment you start to lie to other people, you might start lying to yourself, and then you know what is your life gonna become? You right. know, like right. you know, powerful. And then, then Jocko, another quote that I really like is discipline is freedom. And that might be my favorite quote for life because I have like a very ADD mind. I have like a very, I live a very disciplined way because I can be very undisciplined naturally. Like I can do, yeah, me too. like me as a little kid, I was very mischievous, troublesome kid, yeah. right? But like, you know, through soccer and through my family and my friends and, and, and you know, working hard and discipline, I was able to corral the, the mischievous energy and channel it to something good. Right. So like discipline is freedom. When Jocko Willink says that it basically means like your mind always wants to be undisciplined. Like you should go brush your teeth, go for that right. run, reach out to that person, do that homework, but your mind's like, ah, I could wait another minute. Yeah. Ah, I don't have to work out today. Ah, I could take a rest. I could watch that TV show. I could do this, do that. And your mind will do like your mind will fucking convince you to do anything it wants. It's impulses. They can be sexual impulses. They can be hunger impulses to eat that fucking snack. But either way, if you have discipline, then you're free. You're not a slave to your mind's impulses to do whatever it wants. You know, so like I think all of that stuff that we're talking about is really really crucial bro and you've lived it you've lived the discipline discipline life that's why you're able to be at the level you're at so i i take inspiration from it bro and then you know inspiration is perishable too that's another good quote like act on your inspiration because it'll disappear eventually like right. you're inspired right. to make a podcast or write a blog or whatever the fuck do it now because it's gonna disappear soon and you're not gonna want to do it anymore and yeah. um yeah, you just gotta act. You gotta act and be disciplined, bro. I yeah, think I think what you're saying is key. Yeah. So, anyways, to pick it back where I'm at now, so mm. I was able to to join Union Omaha uh, over my uh, off season. You know, I was looking at places to go. Me and my agent. You no, know, it was it was a good opportunity to come here. They actually are former champs. They won the league last year. So mm. I, I come to 
even though they lost most of their guys, they all went up to a different level. So I was like, oh, you know, it's a good opportunity for me to come here and get a, you know, do well to be able to prepare myself. And then I don't know if you heard of the Open Cup. It's it's kind of like an FA Cup, you know, things like that. We actually had a really great run with this team. It's the furthest oh, yeah. uh, a team in our league ever made it that far. Really? Hell yeah, bro. How'd y'all do? Bro, we made it to the quarterfinals. We, we beat hey. two MLS teams. Who who would you beat? Chicago Fire was our first game. Shit. I went to PK. So it was crazy, that game. That game was an insane game. Uh, they scored two PKs on us. And the, the second one was, like, with five minutes left. And we ended up tying that game in overtime. Because we ended up going to OT 1-1. And then they scored in overtime. And then we scored, like, with three, like, maybe, like, two minutes left in the game. And we ended up going to PKs and beating them there. Hell, yeah, oh, bro. What a game. Oh, what a game. And me making – I made the PK in order to – my teammate ended up finishing it off. Look, it was yeah. awesome. What did that feel to beat an MLS team from, you know, being in y'all's division? Like, y'all were just like, hell yeah. Like, bro, awesome. We couldn't believe it, you know, like, <laughs> the MLS team, you know? Hell yeah. Was, That's what's so hard. cool about those cups, bro. The FA Cup yeah. and Open Cup. It's like, it's anybody's game. That's dope. Yeah, and it kind of put, you know, our team, you know, kind of on the map a little bit. Like, oh, look, you know, look at this team making a run. We ended up being Minnesota United 2-1. And then we go... And actually, somebody else in our league um, were beating MLS teams, too. So, it kind of like, oh, do you, you know, these these lower division teams, are, hey, you know, they actually can compete with, with yeah. some of these teams in MLS. And we ended up beating them. We made it to quarterfinal, but we lost to Sporting KC. And that was the end of our run. But it was awesome to, to see how our team was able to achieve that. Oh, yeah, bro. We played a ton of games so far. Uh, after that, Chicago Fire wasn't able to play anymore because that. Then the following game that weekend, I had to my ACL. Not in the game, but trainings after I had to my ACL. And then now I'm here. You know, three months later, our team's doing well. We're in we're in second place right now in the league. Oh, that's so, dope, bro. So the Chicago Fire game was your last game that you played before tearing it? No, and we played a season game. Okay, got it. Uh, a regular season game. We ended up winning three zero, and then the day. Uh, we had a day off and I came back and tore it. I don't tear it, bro. I'm sorry yeah. to hear, man. I'm sorry to hear, but I mean, that's a, I mean, if there, if, if you were to stop playing and choose to go another route, you know, like that's a badass, nice little way to end it, you know, being in a lower division team and sticking it to the MLS and beating Chicago, you know? Yeah, it's cool, you know. And I was really motivated to come back because I don't have a professional goal in my name. And you know? I, I love scoring goals. And the fact that, you know, I could end, end it that way, it's always going to be that burning desire. You know, oh, I didn't get a professional goal, but I think that's going to help me prepare me to go harder, you know, on my next journey to, you know. You know, it's fine. And then whenever a kid's one day, like, hey, dad didn't get a professional goal, but look where I am now. Yeah. You know, if my life was only based on soccer, then that's not a life worth living, you know, if, if mm -hmm. I can only base my success in soccer. I want to, you know, be more than that. For sure. That's dope. So, That's a beautiful thing, bro. And I think a lot of athletes feel it, right? Like you see like LeBron James and, and a lot of other athletes, um, they have the saying, you know, more than an athlete, you know, and that's a whole brand. Um, and that's dope that you have that ambition, bro. But I, I feel like in a sense, you kind of did score a pro goal, right? Because you scored on an MLS keeper. But maybe right. maybe he might have not, you know, been completely on his toes. You know, it's not like he was playing Austin FC, FCD or LAFC, but like you fucking scored on him. You scored on a on a legit pro team. Yeah, that was crazy. If I would have missed, we would have lost the game. Yeah, Five. like you put the team on your back in that moment and came through, you know? It was a, it was a good it was a good feeling. Definitely getting them to go the wrong way and man we did that. It was cool, man. It's That's what's up, bro. Yeah. So I feel like you're you're kind of leaning more like you want to do the other stuff. You want to move on from the game. Like, is that you kind of like, like a little percent leaning more that way? Or? Yeah, a little bit going percent, okay. but we'll see. You we'll know, see, bro. We'll whenever, see. you know, maybe I'm fully back and then that, that thing is time you can, you know, always just get that spark back. You know, it's, it's mm. always difficult since I played this and I was four. You know, I always said if I do end up, you know, moving away, I know these next two years are going to be hard because I've been doing something my whole life that I've always known, you know. It's always hard, bro. It's always really hard. And I've had this conversation with so many people. It's like the, the identity. Yeah, correct. That you have of being an athlete and being a soccer player and all the things the game has taught you and done for you. It's really hard to say goodbye to your playing days. Like you don't say goodbye to the game entirely because you still train 
and you still train kids and you're still around the game, even if you're on the business side of it, but there's just nothing like playing at the highest level. There's nothing being in that environment for your team. Nothing, bro. Competing every day is not the same. That fire in your belly when you look at the field, and I know I can get out there and compete. I know I could be there. That's gonna, that's gonna be the hardest thing. The ego. The ego always wants to, yeah, to, to come back every now and then. Like, my yeah, God. it's the ego, but it's also love for the game. You know, like right. you love it. Like that shit right. made you. It's like you know, it's yeah, it's a beautiful thing, bro. It, it, and like, no matter what you decide to do, but it, it's. It's hard. It's hard to say goodbye. It doesn't make it any easier. Very hard. No matter what Very you have hard. lined up, you know, like and and pro athletes, any athlete goes through it. But um, so bro, like you talked a lot about your family being a big piece of why you've made it this far, bro. Like I know some people that think their kids shouldn't play sports, right? Like oh, if they're not gonna go pro or they're not gonna get a D one scholarship out of it, what's the point, right? Like what would you say to that, bro? Like even though your career might might or might not be coming to an end on the field. Like, what would you say to, to all those parents that like, you know, think it might not be worth it for their kid to play, you know, even like coming from your perspective, being that you've made it basically to that level, but might step away now. Um, look, you know, sports, you know, I've, I've tried various, but I think with sports, you know, what I've seen, especially in today's society, our kids growing up now with the telephone and that's what they like to be on. But I think sports is a is a way to develop that type of discipline, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you don't always have to be the great, but you can always tell your kids, I just want to see your best. It's always about pushing them to give them their best, you know. You just want your your child to see that they're giving them their best. That's what they're going to have to experience in life, whether you're starting, you get injured. All these experiences, all these tests that life throws at you, especially as a young kid, I think it's very good to experience. You know what I mean? And, and another thing for parents is always be present for your kid. Always kind of be there for their games because when they look, they're looking always around the field, you know, his mom and dad there, you know, and whenever they see you there that you believe in them, I think it's huge. Just always believe in your kids and always trust that, you know, they'll make the right decision whenever it comes to – whether they don't want to play anymore, whatever it is, just always know and tell them that, hey, I give you all the freedom to fail. I'm always going to love you no matter what. I think it's always good to hear when you say, you know, when your parents say, I'm going to love you no matter what decision you make. And then that gives you all the freedom to to make what you want, you know, kind of the decision you want to make. Yeah, dude. No, yeah. that's that's huge right there, bro. And um, Kobe Bryant actually talks about things. Like if you fundamentally show your kids that you love them and you're going to love them whether they're, a pro on the field or they suck they're more likely to do better they don't have that pressure on them anymore to succeed no. so they'll actually have the mental clarity to be able to yeah. succeed in their best way on the field so i think that's that's a beautiful thing bro um when, when you think back to like those off seasons in college training with your grandpa or playing for your dad's club team like what what would you say to like your whole family your mom your dad you know, playing, growing up, playing with your cousin, like Ivan um, and, and your grandpa, like, what would you say all to them? Like to looking back on your career now? Yeah, I don't want to get emotional, but you know, they, my parents, my mother and my dad always, you know, there's all on my side, the good and the bad, you know, they've always been there. We're positive and we're my hardest critics, you know, they're always my hardest critics, always. No matter if I score to go, you know, you see, you know, there's something they still didn't do well enough, and I'm glad that they pushed me in various ways, whether it was my education. My mother was in the education. Always pushed me. I need, I need, I need good grades, you know, and my dad on that field. Always, you know, never satisfied with how, you know, how well I was doing. And my grandpa, man, that that's my guy right there. You know, he, he taught me this game that I love so much. And it's crazy now. When I was trained with him these past three years, he, he's not as mobile like he used to. He can't really pass me the ball. And just to see him be going out there early in the morning, throwing the ball with me and telling me what to do, I think that gave me all the confidence in the world to, you know, give it everything, not because of him, because of him, but also because he, he believed in me. And I think that was that was very, very big in my life. And I'm so grateful for all of them. Everybody, that's, my grandma, she's been a great, she's always been great to me. She took care of me. My parents are young parents. They had me at 16 years old and been able to 
to manage that, you know, having to experience that at high school and then, you know, help develop me to the person I am today. It's, I'm very thankful, you know, because most 16 year olds don't know what to do and to be able to, for them to, you know, like, all right, we're going to do everything we can for this kid. And I, there's no words to put it to say how much I'm grateful for everybody in my life. For sure. For sure, bro. For sure. That, that's beautifully put, bro. It's, um, man dude a lot a lot of things there like my uh my parents also had me young not not yeah. quite 16 but my mom was 20 and my dad was 21 um yeah. and it's just like you always respect that uh you know having having kids young is very hard like you and me are like you know 24, 24 yeah yeah 24 now that. so like just thinking back think of you like who we were eight years ago like oh my God. uh we're not ready now. We damn sure wouldn't have been ready back then. But like, uh, it's just, you know, you have a lot of respect for it. A lot of respect for, you know, the sacrifice and, and all those things. And like thinking of like your grandpa, right? Like, even though the energy is not there, like it used yeah. to be the mobility, you know, the, the physical health, but like the love is so strong that they still want to help and give, give back. And, and like, yeah, you appreciate all the tactical knowledge when it comes to the game of soccer and the training knowledge, but above all, it's, it's that love and support that like, I fucking believe in you that yeah. you can do this, that you can do anything and you carry that with you forever and you pass it on to your kids and your grandkids. And it's like, you know, we all wish grandparents would never pass away. Like, like um, what, um, my abuelita and like, you know, she's getting older now. And uh, I just think of all the lessons she's taught me. Um, and you know, I I could make myself cry if I wanted to, bro. Like, yeah, me too. I, I can, yeah. Just thinking about it, you know, like just the yeah. the, the lessons of like yeah. that she taught me as a kid in terms of like she was poor. You know, I'm I'm um mostly Mexican, but I'm I'm a little bit Puerto Rican because my great grandma is from Puerto Rico. Okay. So like she would speak to me about, you know, the poverty in Puerto Rico, like not having food, not having shoes, and just like instilling humility in me since I was a little kid. And instilling gratitude in me for everything I had because she would tell me of all the things that she didn't have. And like just thinking of how important those lessons are and how you carry them with you forever. Like even when they're gone, they will always live on. They'll live on through you, through the lessons you teach others, through the lessons they teach. So it's like they're gone, but the the, the lessons and the love are there for eternity. For eternity, bro. And it's just it's a crazy thing. But that is one of the cool things about having young parents, is like yeah. you kind of you, you not only get to meet like more generations. So that's the, my great grandmother's still alive. Thank God. Yeah. She's 84. My grandma's like 62. And then my mom is uh 40, almost 44 now. So like very, very young. Right. So I'm blessed to be able to know all of them and have a good relationship with all of them. But like, uh, it's also cool. Like I, I see some of the things you post, right. And it seems like your parents are like, not only your parents, but they're kind of homies. They're kind of friends. Oh, they're my, they're my, they're my best friends too, man. It's yeah, you know, that's they fucking relate dope. to me a lot because they're they're only forty years old, both of them. Yeah, you know they relate to me a lot, and you know they still do the thing. You know, I know they're not together, but you know they they still are. Con you know, no bad blood. You know, we're we're yeah. all good, and that's what's most important. Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a beautiful thing, bro, to cool. be home. Yeah, it is. Your parents, like uh, that's how we, me and my dad are very, very cool. You yeah, know, he's still my dad. dad. He's still like gets on my ass. We still butt heads. We still all that. We still. Oh, 100%. I feel like you oh, shouldn't be, especially when your kids are young. You should still be a parent as opposed to trying to be a friend. But like as as you get older, it's pretty dope to have that two way dynamic. Like we're we're cool, you know. Like it's 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 definitely something I'm grateful for. Yeah, well, I learned a lot. You know, obviously our parents experienced different things than we did, and sometimes sure. we wonder, like, you know, why they reacted that way. You know, it's kind of cool <laughs> to listen and understand. You know like the way they were raised completely different than we were and like the way they were trying to help, you know, move that process along and do better. You know, I never, never going to judge, you know, my parents with any mistakes they did. Cause you know, I understand life is all about that, you know, making mistakes. No one's perfect. You know, we're not going to be perfect. Nobody is, but I kind of started realizing as I got older, just appreciating my parents, no matter, you know, the mistakes or never felt like they weren't there, but just respecting that they still showed up, you know, I think that's always most important for kids is, is the parents to just be present, you know, be present, always show up no matter what, if you show up, you know, that's what I learned and I'm so grateful. I'm a, I'm a person that's very grateful. I'm always count my blessings every morning, three things I'm grateful for, just simple things to give me, you know, get my mind right.
And sure. when I start thinking about things, it gets me emotional, but it motivates me to just have a great day today. You know, oh, I think it's important that you tell your kids, I mean, that your parents, that you love them every day, even if you can. Because you never know. This life is so short. So I learned life is so short. It can broken in like that. You know what I mean? And just like that, you don't even know. And I'm just. 100%, um, bro. It can end um, It can end in the blink of an eye. And that's why you shouldn't take it for granted. And you should try yeah, to tie up all the loose ends, you know, like. For sure. Forgive for sure. as hard as it is. And, you know, um, tell people how you really feel. Have the courage to do that. Sure, you got me ready to call my pops right now after this, but uh, <laughs> dude, no, it's it's interesting though. It's kind of like it's a beautiful thing and it's a scary thing how short it is because it's like it goes back to that quote you said earlier: like winning is loyal to nobody. Winning is loyal nobody. to nobody. nobody. You're only as good as your last game or your last fight. It's like it's scary as fuck because you could have accomplished everything and then lose it all very quickly. You could have been at the top of the mountain and fall to the bottom very quickly. But at the same time, it's a beautiful thing because you could be at the bottom of the mountain and get to the top. You could have had a shitty loss and get back up there and win the next one. So it's like, it's the yin and the yang of the world, I guess. It's the paradox of like winning's low to nobody. Every day is a new day. Every moment's a new moment. Who you were yesterday is not who you are today. And you got to keep going hard and keep being able to stay true to who you are, but reinvent yourself and like, you know, keep going because it's, it's a new day. It's not low to anybody. You could have had success in the past and then not anymore. And you could have had failure in the past and now have success. So it's, it's a never ending journey, but um, bro, if you were to like give advice in terms of um, how other people that are in their professional journey or their college journey or kids that might listen and they want their dream is to make it to, you know, La Liga, EPL, MLS, Liga MX, whatever, right? What would you say is the biggest piece of advice you could give people that want to go pro in soccer or want to at least go play D1? I'm going to say from my boy, Yankee Johnson. He said, always be, always be stronger than your, your biggest excuse, right? You know, kind of that thing of there's going to be moments where we already talked about it. Your mind is going to creep into you. Oh, let's not do this. Let's not do that. You know, I've experienced everything in this career that you could, from not being on the bench, from having a serious injury, and being successful. You know, my coach says you have a unique ability to experience all those three, right? And what I, what I tell everybody is, like I said, be stronger than your strongest excuse. Always be willing to do more. Always be willing to ask questions. Ask you, doesn't matter, ask questions. It's okay to ask questions, even if it's a dumb question. What are you seeing, coach? How, how can I improve? What are you seeing? How can I improve, right? Simple questions like that. If you, you know, always looking to get better, always looking to progress your game. If you're not good with your left foot, work on your left foot. There's walls, there's space that you can have. Get a ball. All, all you need is one ball yeah. to get better, right? Something I learned, work on your left foot, whatever you need. There's always something you can do every day. You know, it's, it's that 10,000 hours rule, you know, you, you want to be the greatest. You got to, you got to put that time, you got to put the hours in and not, and always very important, have good, great people around you. Cause that's huge. People that either one that are in places that you want to be right. Go ask them for advice. They're already there. Right. That's what I was, when I go back to asking questions, you kind of want to have mimic those guys that already done it before. You, you really don't want to be around the guys that are in the, you feel like on the same level, they're not going to push you. So it's good to have those people around you. Some I learned these past three years of my life. You kind of want people around you that are going to push you. They're not going to tell you, hey, you know, you think you're doing a good job? You can, you can, you can definitely get more. So I think that's huge. I think that's huge for players today. Oh, yeah, bro. For sure. You heard it. You heard it here from someone who did it. Um, all right, bro. To, to wrap it up, to wrap it up, what – is your biggest your your player most proud of at the high school level? We'll start there. Like it could be, you know, Jesuit or Academy. Well, my or, biggest moment that I have. At the I high guess. school level. And then and then we'll go to college. And then and then I want to hear like just of ever. I think it had to be scoring two goals against Bishop Lynch, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I think was it two or three? Because I thought I thought you had a hat trick. No, no. No, I had two, and then I, oh. I think I scored, and I scored in another game. Okay. But I had two against Bishop Lynch. 
I was, I think that was my first varsity game, maybe. Oh, really? Like, year, yeah. The Meister tournament? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that tournament. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, academy year, winning back-to-back in the uh, Development Academy. Hell yeah, bro. Back-to-back. Bro, how were those goals you scored against BL? Like, if I remember correctly. Um, was a, one was a corner. I, it popped, I was on top of the box, popped up back to me. I either chested it or, or died it, and then volleyed it into the net yeah. and the second one was i like chopped it back and then curled it in my left foot i remember both of those bro i wasn't at the game but uh yeah the the other goalie that was in his name was joe defrosia and i do remember you volleyed one in and then you you hit one in just curled it in and i was like, yeah i like cut a defender and curled it yeah yeah was, bro I, I wish i would have been in goal at the time but that's another story <laughs> I still would have went in though. <laughs> it might have. It might have. But maybe, I don't know. Maybe yeah, more would have went in. Now nah, I'm just playing. Nah, I, I like to believe I would have saved one at least. <laughs> yeah. it's always good to. It's always good to have that. Hey, we gotta. We gotta go. What, once you're uh, back in Dallas or something, we gotta go kick around or something, bro. But yeah. um, what? What about like at the at UNC? What was what was the best highlight of the career? Being a captain of the team, bro, for sure. Being a leader, sure. oh, leading yeah. us to uh, back. From a season that you know no one expected, and then bouncing back to go to the final four, it was awesome. You know, yeah, kind of being the vocal guy in the team, and you know, kind of always can ask for advice. I always love those type of roles, you know. So, for sure, pro, yeah, maybe the Chicago Fire, probably. Yeah, 100%. That's probably my biggest moment as a pro for sure. That's what's up, yeah, I, want, I want to give a big shout out to my girlfriend, bro. She's been amazing. I think having a good partner by your side is huge, man. And she's been my, you know, we've, we've gone through a lot, but she's always supported me. She's always, she's always been there. And it's, and I think it, for most people, having a good partner, having someone that's as vicious as you, it's huge. You know, she just got her doctor degree in a physical therapist. So now she's mm-hmm. killing it there. She wants to go back and do more school. So she's, you know, she's very motivated and that helps push me. So I think, Guys out there, hey, find, you know, if you find the right girl that, you know, that's going to push you and believe in you and, you know, give you all the the courage to do whatever you want, I think that's huge. I just want to give her that shout out because she's been immensely important in my life for sure. Damn, bro. No, yeah, that's a beautiful shout out, bro. So she she got her, uh, she's going to be a physical therapist now, huh? She already started. She's been working about, it's her third week now. Oh, shit. That's what's up, bro. Congrats to y'all. That's dope. Uh, what what do you do after after PT school? Like, what, what else could you continue the education in? She wants to get a, a residency. Uh-huh. Like, so she wants to get a specialization in orthopedics. Ah, uh, in uh-huh. orthopedics. That's what's up, yeah. bro. Yeah. Yeah, some people just got that ambition, bro. They got that drive to achieve, and, and y'all both have it. So that makes y'all a good. That's, match, bro. That's dope. That's dope. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pull up to her, bro. Cause my shoulders been. Yeah, been, bro. Pull up to her. Pull up to her. Did you do it in Dallas or what? Yeah, she's in Dallas. Okay, I'm in Austin, but whenever I'm in town, I have to take you up on. That. I'm for real, bro. Cause like my um, I think like tearing your ACL sometimes or, or just having certain injuries, you can have su- weird ways that your body overcompensates and you can have yeah. weird misalignments yeah. like in your I know, I know how I feel. yeah like have you ever have you ever felt that type of shit like in my left glute for example because i tore my left acl there was some kind of like uh discrepancy between like my my glute and my left and my right side and it was starting to leak up into my back and my left hip and it's mm. like made weird things happen yeah. on my shoulder it was just weird you yeah. ever had anything yeah bro it's crazy how even though the injury might be here, you can have something up here that's bothering you. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. And it's the same thing in life, you know. Whenever you think this could be the cause problem, but there's other things that could be causing the problem, you know. So Very it's always all the little metaphors that we can take from everything, really. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of metaphors, a lot of symbolism, bro. But, uh, yeah, no, that's a good point, bro. Like, um, when you're a guy, you know, it's uh, it's cool to, you know, take time and find yourself and, you know, see people and meet people but i think you know if you you do have the opportunity to have a partner that uh aligns with your goals and y'all get along and she's a special person um i think there's a lot of dignity and you know focusing up and and doing what you need to do to keep that relationship strong and achieve success together like i'm very blessed as well like you know for my girlfriend she's always supporting me in all my endeavors and i think she's a big part of my success 
and uh, a lot of the things I've accomplished as well. So I'm, I'm with you there on that yeah, shout bro. out, bro. Shout out, shout out to the ladies, to the uh, special the, ladies. But uh, yeah, 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 dude, I think, I think that's what's up. They're massive in your life, man. Just like moms are, you know, hundred yeah. percent, hundred percent, bro. But Hey, this was fun, Gio. It had been yeah, a couple of years since we talked, bro. Yeah. Um, you know, we both, uh, been doing our thing trying to make it happen and uh yeah i'm, I'm uh, honored to have you on bro and you know hear about your story talk about your story and share it with the people bro i yeah, mean i appreciate you having me on man it's been uh it's been good to you know share this message you know to everyone who or whoever wanted to watch it you know there's always good things to take from our convo today and 100 percent, 100 percent, bro um i guess last thing like if there was um any resources that you think also helped you get to the top that other people could access? Like what, what, what do you think those are? Books, podcasts, um, you know, if you have a, if you have mental issues, you know, it's always good to have a therapist, you know, yeah. someone to talk to. And, Cause you know, sometimes, you know, we can get in our own head sometimes, sometimes, oh, we yeah. can over, you know, for sure. And yeah, just talking to people about, I think the best resource is being open, communicating with people that you're close sure. to, and, you know, being vulnerable. It's, and it's okay to be vulnerable at times, you know, just be honest. Um, 100%. There's know. a lot of strength in, in vulnerability, yeah. man. Like uh, the podcast episode that I released last week, like it was one of my old business professors that had overcome depression. And there's like so much value to be gained from someone who went through it. You know, like if someone is going through it, they'd like to hear preferably from someone who's been through it that can relate that can understand and knows what they feel and how to navigate it so like he shared a lot about his story and it's just it's dope to see people show confidence and strength through like being vulnerable and uh, i think there's a good point you made like we talked a little bit about injury right like acl's torn and meniscus is torn right so like you get those operated on you go to physical therapy you learn how to grow those muscles back up and move again. And it's a whole long process that takes a lot of effort and discipline. And I think for mental, you know, <laughs> mental obstacles, we don't do that. Like in, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of silly in a way when you think about it, right? Like, like, uh, so you go through something traumatic, right? So it's like, you, you break your arm, you rehab yeah. your arm, you rehab, you yeah. fixed. You go through something traumatic in life. It's not within our culture, within our society yet to where like you go through something traumatic, someone passes away, you are abused, something really bad happens to you or someone you love. There's really no standardized way that people like go get their mind fixed, go to right. therapy, do some kind of session, some kind of journaling sessions, perspective, um, things like that to like rehab their mind, you know? And it isn't until someone is like an alcoholic or an addict that they go right. to a 12 step program or then start getting, uh, counseling or therapy, you know, by then it's like, it's we're being reactive, right? Like if you could be proactive about it, just the way we are with physical injuries, with mental injuries and mental traumas, I think there's a lot to be gained from that. And uh, yeah, okay. especially yeah. in our culture, Hispanics, I feel like we got that machismo. Oh, yeah. the, oh, yeah. You know, we don't like to <laughs> talk our feelings because, you know, it makes us look weak, but it's not even about being weak, bro. It's just yeah. so it's trying to get better, you know, I think that mental yeah. and mental aspect can you keep it in too much, bro, it's in a, yeah. you know, for yeah, sure. Yeah, bottling it in just leads to an explosion. And yeah, that, yeah. yeah, with the Hispanic community, it is seen as a weakness, but it's really a misconception. There's a podcast I listen to. It's called, it's called The Real Ones. I don't okay. know if you. The Real uh, Ones. The, the Real Ones. It's um, the actor from The Punisher. Have you ever seen that show? Yes. Maybe. A little yeah, bit. Yeah. Not really. I don't I don't watch it regularly or anything. Okay, but, only but, uh, but anyways, he's a main host, and he brings the the Transformers guy Shay LeBeau, and he uh -huh. kind of talks about his mental journey, bro. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Get, so the real ones, good. the real ones, yeah. Bet, bet. Okay, where can the people find you, bro? Like on IG, on what? IG, yeah, IG, Twitter. Um, I think my handle is Giovanni M Ten underscore Giovanni, Giovanni. M Ten. I'll drop yeah. it in the description, bro. But yeah, yeah. it was fun, bro. Oh, appreciate it. Don't be such a smart Alex.